And you're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2. We are on location at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., where we're meeting some of the professors who have also written books. Joining us now is Professor Matthew Green, who has written this book, The Speaker of the House, A Study of Leadership. Professor Green, what's the Speaker of the House responsible for? Well, the Speaker of the House has a number of responsibilities. Um, he or she is the top officer of the House of Representatives and, in fact, the only one named in the Constitution. And so there's an expectation that speakers are there to represent the House of Representatives uh, with the Senate and to the American people. In a practical matter, the speaker is responsible for ensuring that the House operates correctly, ensuring that uh, legislation is enacted, helping to develop the agenda, um, interacting with the president, interacting with the American people, um, and ensuring that, in general, that the House is, is working the will of the people. Could anyone be the Speaker of the House? Do you have to be a member of the House to be Speaker? Technically, you do not. All that the Constitution says is that the House shall choose its Speaker. And so, in theory, anyone can run for Speaker of the House. As a practical matter, it's always been a member of the House of Representatives, but that is not a limitation that the Constitution imposes on the selection of the Speaker. How partisan is the post? That's a great question, and the, I would say this, that the partisanship of the Office of Speaker has changed over time. Um, from the very beginning, the Office of Speaker had both partisan and nonpartisan responsibilities. In other words, to some extent, the Speaker was expected to represent the majority party in the House, but also to some extent, um, <clears throat> the Speaker has parliamentary responsibilities, ensuring that um, that the rules are followed, that every member has the same rights and is treated fairly, and to preside over the day-to-day -day, uh, operations of, of the House and the House floor. Over time, the position of the Speaker has become more partisan and um, I would say reached its, the height of contemporary partisanship around the 1990s and 2000s with um, Speaker Gingrich and, and Speaker Pelosi. Um, Speaker Boehner has pulled away to some extent from that and I think has tried to reintroduce some of the less partisan aspects of the speakership, but it's still a very partisan position and the majority party in the House expects the speaker to carry out the will of the majority party. When you look back at the history of the speakers, uh, who have been some of the more effective ones or well-known ones? Uh, well, <clears throat> the first that comes to mind is Sam Rayburn, who was speaker from uh, 1940. Uh, until, 19, until the early 1960s. Uh, and he was a prominent speaker in part because he lasted so long. He served uh, off and on for 20 years and it's very rare to have a speaker um, last as long as that, certainly not more than two or three terms. But he also was a rare speaker in that he understood the house in which he served and he understood what it was that motivated members of the House of Representatives really had what you might say is a feel for the chamber and that made it possible for him to get a lot done as speaker because he knew what was possible. He understood the art of the possible in, in congressional politics. And some of the, some major legislation that was enacted during that time period was enacted during his speakership, whether it was transportation legislation, some early civil rights legislation, um, so legislation related to uh, World War II. Um, so he was in many ways one of the most effective and best known speakers of the House of Representatives. We've also had <clears throat> recent speakers who have demonstrated considerable effectiveness. Um, Newt Gingrich in his early years, particularly the first 100 days, um, really turned the House into a, a real machine just producing major, major legislation under his leadership relatively swiftly, which was very impressive. Um, Nancy Pelosi, in particular, the enactment of health care legislation, which was uh, a huge feat and sort of a last minute uh, outcome, uh, in large part because of her leadership. Um, so we've had uh, speakers, uh, you know, most speakers, at least since the 1940s, are known for at least producing one major work of uh, legislation. But certainly at the top of that list, I'd have to say, would be Sam Rayburn. What's the Speaker's normal interaction with the Senate? With the Senate? 
I wouldn't say that this pres the speaker has a normal interaction with the Senate. It varies by who the speaker is. It varies by which party is in control of the House and which party is in control of the Senate. And it varies on the personal or the personalities of the speaker and the Senate leadership. Um, there's an expectation that speakers need to have an open line of communication with the leadership in the Senate because you can't get any legislation enacted if, without the Senate's uh, approval. And so to that respect, there, there is some kind of communication or relationship. But the degree of closeness that there is between, say, the Speaker and the Senate or Senate leaders is going to vary tremendously um, by who the individual Speaker is and who the leaders in the Senate are. Matthew Green, who have been some of the least effective speakers? <laughs> <coughs> least effective speakers. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> Good question. <clears throat> I'd say there's certainly a host of speakers in the 19th century that didn't serve very long and aren't known for doing very much. Um, and so you could put those on the list. But if we wanted to, again, keep our focus on speakers since the 1940s, which is the, the focus of the book, looking at speakers since the 1940s, I would say the first name that comes to mind is probably either Carl Albert, who served in the uh, early 1970s, or John McCormick, who came right after Rayburn and served from 1961 until 1970. Um, they had, for various reasons, a more difficult time getting legislation enacted. To some extent, they had a more difficult party to work with. The majority party, the majority Democrats, had rebels. It had folks who wanted to go their own way, and that just makes it hard to enact legislation. Um, they also had some personal issues, for example, McCormick, particularly towards the end. Uh, <clears throat> he had been waiting <clears throat> to be speaker for many, many years. And so when he finally uh, got the chance, he was uh, somewhat elderly. And uh, I had heard at one point that he even presided over the house with an oxygen tank. And so he didn't necessarily have the, the fortitude, the constitution necessary to uh, <clears throat> really <clears throat> put in the, the effort necessary in order to to get big legislation done. So, um, so I would say that McCormick and Albert were probably on lower on the list of those who were effective contemporary speakers. How would you grade John <clears throat> Boehner? How would I grade John Boehner? <clears throat> well, I hesitate to grade uh, John Boehner uh, to the extent that he's still speaker. And uh, we see in history that sometimes speakers save their biggest and most amazing uh, accomplishments for the end of their tenure. So we still have, I think the jury is still out. Um, <clears throat> I would say this about Speaker Boehner. Um, back in the early 1930s, we had a speaker named John Nance Garner, who was a Democrat from Texas and later became vice president under FDR. And he once said that uh, the speakership is the hardest job in Washington. And I think that that pretty much sums up the experience of John Boehner. Imagine how much has changed since the 1930s when John Nance Garner was saying this. If anything, the job has gotten exponentially more difficult, where now speakers have to deal with um, huge amounts of campaign funding, independent <coughs> groups that are funding sometimes primary challenges against members of your party. You have a 24-hour news cycle. You have a plethora of interest groups. All these things are putting tremendous pressure on the job of speaker to try to get things done without making too many people angry. And I think that uh, Boehner certainly has to go through, has, has, those are challenges to his speakership. And then you couple that with um, some of the more, uh, <clears throat> shall we say, independent-minded members of his party right now in the House of Representatives that make it harder for him to count on the party loyalty that's necessary to enact legislation, especially when you can't get any votes from the minority party. So um, I would say that Boehner has uh, he's done, in some ways, the best he could do with a bad hand that he's been dealt. Professor Green, members, uh, speakers <clears throat> are also members of Congress. How much attention do they pay to their particular district once well, they is, become speaker? This is one of the things that I argue in the book, that traditionally people assume that once speakers become speaker, what they're thinking about really is their party. They want to do what their party wants. After all, it's their party, the majority party, that decides who the speaker is going to be. And while I acknowledge that that's true to uh, a large degree in the book, what I also point out is that speakers have done things on behalf of issues and concerns that matter to them personally. And so every once in a while, we see speakers pressing for legislation that doesn't seem particularly important to the majority party in the House of Representatives. 
um, or even to the president, but matters to them personally, whether it's in the case of Speaker Boehner, issues like education, which is very important to him personally. Um, and if we look further back in the past, um, Nancy